All right, well, um, if any of you are still remaining online, uh, if you haven't gone away with the kids, uh, you might be thinking, gosh, we let this guy sing. We never thought he'd actually get on the stage and talk. Uh, <laughs> um, I do uh, hope I'm not too long-winded, but um, I am just a vessel, right? Just as all of you. Um, I may be up here on the stage this morning, but you know, don't, don't look at me. Um, I am just a vessel of a great and mighty God that we serve, right? And he wants each one of us... Um, to be ready, right, at any point in time, any given time, to share the truth that he's given us. And we have a wonderful, uh, wonderful truth of Yeshua the Messiah. Um, so to give a little context of where we are, I have been teaching the adult Shabbat school cl class for a little while, and we've been going through the book of Acts. And this is a book, I mean, you guys, are, I'm sure, are all familiar with it, right? But this is a book really about God's unstoppable plan. And it's a big account of everything that God is doing, right, uh, that he promised all the way back to Abraham, to you, right, from you, Israel, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed, right? That is a testimony of everything that God is doing uh, throughout this book, right? It's another chapter of, you know, again, God's word, right? God's word is planned for salvation. God desires that none shall perish, but all may come to know the Lord, right? And in an act, and specifically in the chapter, the portion we're going to talk about this morning, we're continuing on a look of Paul's journey and what Paul is doing specifically, and I think there is a lot of things that we can um, glean and learn and be encouraged by in evaluating the way Paul operates, right? The way he operates. Yeah, we're going to break down uh, kind of his personality, his quirks, his lifestyle, right? And I think, and my prayer is that that is an encouragement to you because I was, I was praying the past few weeks about what to share. Um, I very much heard the Lord say, encourage my brethren, encourage your brethren, encourage my people. All right, so my prayer is that this message will be one of encouragement to you. Um, so we're going to give a little context before we can land the plane, right? I've got to help you guys see where the runway is, uh, so we land in the right spot. But um, bear with me if you would, um, and we'll, we'll get into our portion as well. But let me, uh, let me get some context established for you. So um, if we think about, again, you know, going out from Jerusalem and to all the surrounding regions, right? Uh, through the book of Acts, we've seen a lot of regions accounted for. We've seen Asia Minor, we've seen Galatia, we've seen the Mediterranean Isles, we've seen Macedonia, uh, Greece, all the way to Rome, right? Paul, has, on his second journey now, has done you know, a lot of traveling, right? He didn't stay in one location. He's done a lot of traveling. But what's been unique about his travels in all of these different locations is the single message of Yeshua being the Messiah, the single message of Yeshua being the Messiah, right? We know Yeshua was, was killed at the hands of men, and we know he was raised from the dead, right? That is Paul's single message whenever he goes out to all these towns. And the result of that message is culture shattering, right? He has been changing cultures, changing cultures, changing people, changing towns, Right? And we see he's addressing political climates, he's addressing civil climate, climates, right? And all these accounts that are documented by Luke, Luke who wrote this book, right? They're showing lives being transformed. Lives being transformed. And again, not just individual lives, but communities being transformed. Cultures being transformed. And the cool thing is, right? It didn't stop there. Because of all this, right? This very same message, this very same truth has come all the way to you and I today, right? If I'm not mistaken, and I don't think I am, I'm often wrong, but um, I don't think I am in this part, right? Um, the message hasn't changed. Yeshua is still the Messiah, right? Salvation is by grace through faith in him alone, right? That truth is the same as it was when Paul was proclaiming it. That is the same truth that you and I can proclaim as well. That truth has remained the same, right? And again, we've been receivers of it, so who are we to selfishly keep it to ourselves? We need to be, instead, shining brightly into the world around us, right? We, uh, uh, we are called to be a part of God's unstoppable plan, to be messengers of this great, good, this great news that we have to share, right? Um, so the question we have to ask ourselves is, you know, are we a part of this? Are we being a part of this unstoppable plan? Or are we just hiding ourselves away in, you know, under a basket or in a closet somewhere and not, shining, you know, and not sharing with those around us? Or, conversely, do you put yourself on a nightstand? 
Do you let your light shine, the light of God shine brightly to those around you? Another question to ask, are you the same person you were before you came to faith? Are you the same person you were before you came to faith? Or are you living out a transformed life? Right? Because it's an, we are in an unsympathetic world. Right? That is truth. But are you living out a transformed life? Your life should be transformed, right? And we get in, as we get into chapter 18 of the book of Acts, um, we see you know, Paul's arriving in Corinth, right? It's where he gets to um, in the book of Acts. And a um, little history on, on, on Corinth. Well, Corinth is the capital of the region Achaia. Achaia, okay? So this city of Corinth was a pretty large city, actually. What surprised me was um, it was actually it's 20 times the population of Athens, Right? I was thinking Athens would have probably been the most populous city at that time, but no, Corinth was actually 20 times estimated, of course, the population of Athens, right? So the entire southern portion of Greece, right, called Achaia, was pretty much an island, pretty much an island, right? Except for one tiny little snippet of land, right? So technically, it's, uh, it's, an, it's a peninsula, right? Surrounded by water on all sides except for one little spot, right? This little neck of land... Uh, that, that connects, you know, the, the main body with this portion of land was actually only three and a half miles across. That's it, three and a half miles across, right? It takes us no time in our cars today to, to drive three and a half miles, right? Well, this little bit of land, this little narrow strip was known as the Peloponnesian Peninsula. You can say that with me, Peloponnesian Peninsula, right? And it was across this particular area where Corinth was located. Now, we know Paul moved around, um, you know, his process, let me say this, uh, of moving within a city once he arrived was fairly formulaic, right? And those of us who are, are members or who attend uh, Hobos regularly, we, you know, I think we understand this, right? His, his movement was rather formulaic. He got to a city. Where did he go first? He went to the synagogue first, right? He went to the synagogue first. When he was done speaking in the synagogue, he'd go into the marketplaces. He'd go wherever anybody else was congregating, right, to share the good news. That was a pretty formulaic approach. Any place Paul went, that's the path that he followed, right? But what was not formulaic was how he shared the good news with those around him. That was not formulaic, right? And one of the things that we need to learn from observation of, of Paul's preaching style is that he doesn't have a, a single, uh, you know, canned approach. He's not always sharing the good news in the same way. He's not always doing it the same way. He's always sharing the good news, right? He's always sharing the good news. We already talked about what that is. But he's always doing it in a different way. Why? Because he cares about the people whom he's talking to. And he wants to be effective, right? So an, here's an important uh, principle for us to take heed of, right? Our approach, when you and I are sharing the good news, needs to be tailored based upon the response we are receiving. Our approach and how we share the good news, still the same good news, very same message that Paul was giving, just like Paul, we need to tailor our uh, pr presentation of that good news based upon the response we're receiving. Right? Colossians chapter 4, verse 6 says this, Let your speech always be with grace, as though seasoned with salt, so that you will know how to respond to each person. Seasoned with salt, right? Seasoned with salt. Salt, um, when you're cooking, right, it's, it's not the main ingredient. If it is, it's not going to be an edible dish, right? Um, we have to be observing how our speech is being received and tailor it accordingly. Let your words be seasoned with salt, right? Said differently, think about it this way. Conversely, if you are just shoving what you have to say right down somebody's throat, what's going to happen? They're going to choke. They are going to choke, right? And when you're choking, you're not able to take anything in, right? So it's ineffective if we're just shoving a message down somebody's throat. Paul reasoned with anyone whom he was speaking to. There are many, many accounts. Uh, we've seen it, especially in the book of Acts, right, where it says Paul reasoned with them. We have a reasonable faith. Our faith is reasonable, right? It may be foreign to some of the ears that are hearing it, but it is a reasonable faith, right, that we can explain and share with others, right? So Paul reasoned with anyone whom he was talking to. He, you know, from Orthodox Jews in the synagogue to idol-worshipping Greeks in the marketplace, right? He reasoned with them. 
He reasoned within that same message that Yeshua, Jesus, is the Messiah of Israel and the Savior of the world. Right? He reasoned with the Jewish people over the Jewish scriptures. Right? He reasoned with secular people uh, over the secular ideas. And because of this, he was tremendously effective in what he did. He was tremendously effective in what he did. Right? He, he reasoned, he persuaded, he testified. And this is what we should all be doing. Every single one of us who know Yeshua as the Messiah and have this good news should be doing this exact same thing. And you can. This isn't something that only Paul was empowered to do. This is something that we are all empowered to do and called to do. Reason, persuade, and testify this great news that we have, right? No matter where you are. It doesn't matter what your occupation is. This is what we should all be doing. I work for a bank. Woo! Right? Is that exciting in the, in, in the perspective of eternity? No. But it is a, a, a breeding ground, right? A, a um, field of, uh, what's the heck was the word I'm looking for? Uh, anyway, it, there's so many people there that need to hear the good news, right? The harvest is plentiful, right? That's what I was trying to say. The harvest is plentiful even in a bank, right? In uptown Charlotte, right? So while the, the work may not have an eternal value, the work provides an opportunity to have an eternal perspective, an eternal value to somebody, right? To share with them this great news. Um, so if you're asking yourself, you know, what am I supposed to do with my life, right? What am I supposed to do with my life? What do I do? Well, stop making excuses for yourself, right? Stop making excuses for yourself. In uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 19 to 23, Paul says this, a little bit of a long verse, but... Uh, it says, for though I am free from all men, I have made myself a slave to all, so that I may win more. To the Jews I became as a Jew, so that I might win Jews. To those who are under the law, as under the law, though not myself being under the law, so that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without law, as without law, though not being without law, um, without the law of God, right? But under the law of Messiah, the law of grace. Uh, so that I might win those who are without the law. To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things for the sake of the good news, so that I may become a fellow partaker of it. Why did Paul live like this? Why did he live like this? To win people for the good news. He did it to win people for the good news, right? He did it to win Jews, he, li- he did it to win those who live as though under the law. He did it to win those who live as, you know, there is, as though there is no law. He did it to win those who are weak. Do you care enough about your witness to other people that you're willing to become like them? To get to where they are on their level. Right? If we don't connect with them and get to them, relate to them where they are on their level we're not going to have a chance to win them for salvation, right? Is it not worth us giving up ourselves in order to save some? Is it not worth it? Or are we too proud? Are we too caught up in our own pride, right? Unwavering in our appearance, right? We know, oh, this is the only way, which is true, right? But we're so fixed that we're we're shoving a message down somebody's throat rather than paying attention to how they're receiving it and, and tailoring the message accordingly, right? If we, do, if, we, if we don't pay attention to who we're talking to, they're not going to open the door, right? They're not even going to let you into their lives because you simply cannot relate to them. They're just going to cast you off, right? You're going to have no impact. So we have to take the, understand the importance of connecting with people when we're sharing the good news. We cannot come across as ignorant brethren. If we come across as ignorant people, we're not going to have any chance of winning them for the Lord. Care more about others than you care about yourself, Right? Be willing to understand people and to relate to who they are uh, in order to win them from the Lord. And we're going to see this is exactly what Paul did everywhere he went. He could talk about the Jewish scriptures. He could talk about Greek mythology. Right? Think about who Paul was. Right? He grew up. Right? We know who, who he is and what he did. Think of the structure and everything that he knew about the Jewish scriptures. Right? Torah observance, all of that stuff. Yet, we also know... He knew Greek mythology. And he used that, you know, very, you know, secular idea to witness to people. Right? 
because he cared more about them. He cared more about them. Um, little story, a wise man once told me um, that he used to participate in debates, right? Pretty frequently he'd participate in debates, right? These were uh, religious debates with other believers or even non-believers, right? And when we were talking, I asked him, you know, what did you think, I asked him, what did he think about um, it now? Like looking back, what, you know, on that time of his life, was it worth it? Was it worth it? Uh, and his answer was, no. No, it wasn't worth it. Why? Well, because for all, here's what he said, because for all those people whom I beat in a debate, not one did I win for the Lord. Yeah, right? Oh, big deal, you beat him in the debate, but you didn't win him for the Lord. We have to keep things in perspective, right? It's not worth it, right? We have to be willing to care more about other people and put aside our desire to, to win a debate or anything like that, right? And this is true for our witness and our contribution to Messiah's community, right? This is what it means to equip people to live a hope-filled life, right? This is what it looks like to relate to one another, to be a community together, to encourage one another, right? To strengthen the, um, each other's relationships with God, right? So that we can endure trials and tribulations, wind and waves, because you know what? They are coming our way. They always will. They absolutely always will. Okay, so that's kind of the initial groundwork. We're going to break into our verses now starting, uh, we're in the book, chapter 18 of the book of Acts. We're going to start with verses 5 through 6. Um, we're going to get through 11, Lord willing, um, if people are still here and awake. But uh, we're going to break it down into each particular portion uh, in accordance with your outline that uh, was available online for you. So um, Acts chapter 18, verses 5 through 6 says, But when Silas and Timothy came down from Macedonia, Paul began devoting himself completely to the word solemnly testifying to the Jews that Yeshua, Jesus, was the Messiah. But when they resisted and blasphemed, he shook out his garments and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am clean. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Woo! That's pretty heavy, right? So let's understand what's going on here, right? Um, so... At the beginning of verse 5, it's saying he's able to put aside, we know, for those of you who are um, with us in, in the Acts class in the mornings, um, we all, uh, you know, according to Scripture, know Paul as a tent maker, right? Um, but when we looked at the Greek word, it actually means kind of like leather worker, right? And we looked at how working with leather was obviously a big component of working with tents and making tents. So um, it is pretty safe to assume that Paul didn't just make tents, he worked with leather, and tents was probably just one of the primary things that he helped to manufacture, right? So he had an occupation, he had a trade, which is a very important thing in Jewish culture, right? The Talmud even talks about, um, you know, if a father's not teaching his son a trade, he's teaching him to steal, right? Uh, so it was very important, and we see it, Paul growing up, having learned to trade from his father. And up until this point, he's been focused on balancing the two, right? Ministry work, trade, right? He has to work to, to make an income and, and all of that. But here we see um, that he can put it aside, right? All of a sudden, Silas and Timothy come down and he can put this aside. And um, I think it's important to understand, again, you know, when we talk about good news, uh, Paul said it well earlier in chapter 13 where he says, um, Therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, that through him forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you, and through him everyone who believes is freed from all things, from which you could not be freed through the law of Moses, right? So we've seen in Acts this huge debate and discussion around what does it mean to be saved, right? What do Jews need to do to be saved? What do Gentiles need to do to be saved? Is it any different? Is it the same? All of these things have been discussed and debated with the congregation in Jerusalem, and it's just spread, right, to all these different congregations that are being formed uh, according to God's unstoppable plan. Essentially, what we're saying is faith alone by grace alone in Messiah alone, right? That is the good news we have. It's this and nothing else when we talk about salvation, right? Nothing else. We cannot add anything to the um, gift that we have received from Yeshua, right? And I want you to take note when it says there um, in verse 6, right? But when they resisted and blasphemed, it wasn't Paul, it was blaspheming, right? It was not Paul, it was they, right? It was those who did not agree with his good news. Now, some misinterpret that to mean it was the Jews, 
That's not true, because many of the Jews in the synagogue will see in a few verses come to faith and believe, right? But there were some who were opposed to that message. Those are the ones who are being called out here, because um, they resist and they're blaspheming, right? To deny Yeshua as the Messiah is to blaspheme against God. To deny Yeshua as the Messiah is to blaspheme against God, okay? Faith alone by grace alone in Messiah alone. John 3.18 says it this way, he who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Now, you might think that Paul went a bit far here, right? Talking about, you know, blood being on your heads. That's a pretty strong phrase. I, th or phrase. I think if we said that to somebody today, they might take offense to that, right? Pretty safe assumption. Um, but we need to understand where that phrase comes from. Right? He's using a popular uh, Old Covenant phrase, which speaks of you know, bearing uh, the responsibility of your own actions. Right? Bearing the responsibility of your own actions, or inaction, as it may be. Um, and I want to read a portion to you. Ooh, that's a bit hard to see. <laughs> um, from Ezekiel, chapter 33, uh, verses 1 through 6. Ezekiel 33, 1 through 6. But this will give you a good idea of where Paul is getting this, at the time, popular phrase from. It says this, and the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, speak to the sons of your people and say to them, if I bring a sword upon a land and the people of the land take one man from among them and make, make him their watchman and he sees the sword coming upon the, word, the, excuse me, upon the land and blows on the trumpet and warns the people then he who hears the sound of the trumpet and does not take warning and a sword comes and takes him away, the blood will be on his own head. Blood will be on his own head, right? Um, conversely, those who do take warning are saved, right? They're spared from the sword. Paul is declaring himself clean because he has warned. He has warned. Right? He sounded the trumpet. He's declared to them that a sword is coming. And I have news for you. The sword doesn't move like a Zamboni. Right? Anybody, you guys know what a Zamboni is? The little slow ice machine? Yeah, right? It doesn't move like that. <laughs> right? It's coming quick. It's coming quick. And the key thing is, right? If you keep reading on in Ezekiel, it says um, that God has appointed us, you and I, as watchmen for the house of Israel. And if we don't share the warning, then the, their blood is on us, is what God declares. If we know a sword is coming and we don't sound the trumpet, their blood is on us. We are not responsible for their response. We are responsible for sounding the trumpet. And God takes that very seriously. And that's why he says, you and I are the watchmen of Israel, right? We are the ones who need to sound the trumpet because we know a sword is coming. You know the truth. Are you giving warning to people, right? What else is going on here? Well, when Jews would return from Gentile areas, they would um, stop and shake the dust off their feet before they crossed the line into um, you know, their land. Right? And the idea behind that was they didn't want to bring unholy Gentile dust into their, you know, into their holy ground. Right? But we know that Yeshua himself told his disciples to shake the dust off their feet if they don't receive you. Right? Shake the dust off um, their feet. That's what he told his disciples. Um, if they don't receive you, right? So this is what Paul's doing here, right? He's showing the unbelieving Jews here um, and saying, you know, that he was going to go to the Gentiles and didn't want to bring any of their uh, unholy dust, right? Or blaspheming dust with them, right? That's the, the message that he's having upon his audience at this point in time. And to use a, ver a phrase from uh, verse 6 of chapter 17, uh, which was spoken, I think this is really cool, by those who didn't like what Paul was saying, right? 
Um, this is when they had, well, he cast out a demon of a, a slave, um, demon-possessed girl, and the owners of this slave were like, oh no, our prophet's gone, right? And they drag him before the marketplace, right? And here's what they accused him of, right? You ready for this? This man is turning our world upside down. You're darn right we are. You are darn right we are, right? What the world says is right way up, we know is upside down. What the world calls upside down, we know is right side up. Find God's work. This is another lesson we've been learning and talking about. And you'll find the devil's work. Find God's work. You'll find the devil's work, right? Every action, you guys know this phrase, every action has an equal and opposite reaction. Yeah, good. We've got some physics, uh, physics class uh, attenders here. Um, when God is at work, right, you will always find the devil trying to counteract that very work. The devil wants to oppose what God is doing. And one of the coolest stories we've been discussing to use this, to, to, to get a good picture of this uh, from an application perspective is Nehemiah. Nehemiah, right? What did he do, right? He's, he is uh, building the wall in the Old Covenant, right? He's building it. That's what God wants him to do. He's empowered by the Spirit. Um, he's, you know, he's come hundreds of miles from where he was in Persia to Jerusalem. And, you know, God gives him the power. God gives him the strength. God gives them, I think it's about 50,000 people, right, to do it together. Yay, we're going to go build this wall. It's going to be smooth sailing. It wasn't smooth sailing, right? It was not smooth sailing. When the tiny ship left its tropic port for a three-hour tour, right, Gilligan thought it was going to be smooth sailing. I'm glad somebody laughed. Thank you, Lori. <laughs> right? But the weather started getting rough, and the tiny ship was tossed. It's going to be stuck in all your heads. You're welcome. Um, but the next part of this wonderful jingle, if not for the courage of the fearless crew, right, the minnow would have been lost, right? If not for the courage of the fearless crew, right? It wasn't smooth sailing for Nehemiah and his crew, right? There was this guy named Sanballat. Don't call your kids Sanballat. Not a good idea. And he was a, a Horonite. Really don't call your kids that one, okay? <laughs> Um, so this, this unfortunate named dude, right, was associated with Tobiah, uh, the Ammonites, and Geshem, the Arab, right? And according to Nehemiah, when he and his group arrived in Jerusalem, the return aroused the enmity of Sanballat and his allies, right? It didn't sit well with them. Nehemiah chapter 2 verse 10 actually says that they were aggrieved, right? They were aggrieved that the welfare of the Jews should be fostered. What does that mean? Nobody should be caring about the welfare of the Jews, is what their perspective was. And it burned, burned them, right? It, it boiled their blood that somebody was caring about the Jewish people. How dare they, right? In other words, again, it, it hurt them. It pained them, right? It gave them great pain that somebody's here now thinking about the well-being and the safety of the Jewish people. So when Nehemiah initially, you know, discloses his intention of building the walls in Jerusalem, they got mocked. They got mocked. They were despised, right? And they were told, well, they said that uh, rebuilding the wall of Jerusalem would be rebellion against the king, actual rebellion against the king in verse 19, right? But what did Nehemiah do? Did he give up? Did he walk away? Did he think God's not in this? No. He resented, he resented their insinuation and told them, y'all have no right in Jerusalem. He probably didn't say y'all, but you all have no right in Jerusalem, right? Nor any interest in its affairs. He had courage and was fearless in the midst of a storm. Okay, great. Great, now it's all over. Easy, build the wall. Nope, still not over, right? Sanballat didn't just walk away. He didn't walk away, right? So when he actually saw that they were physically rebuilding the wall, just like they said they were going to, he got angry, right? We're getting into Nehemiah chapter, chapter 4 at this point. So you have, think about it, guys. Let's picture it. You have Nehemiah and his group, you know, feverishly rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem on one side, right? And then you have Sanballat and his, you know, armies, his groups, his crew, feverishly organizing their uh, forces to come against and to fight, right? They're at opposition. They are at odds with one another, right? In other words... 
You have the work of God going on to build Jerusalem. You have the work of the devil going on to try and stop it, right? Completely opposite perspectives. So when you're a part of the work of God, here's my encouragement to you. When you are a part of the work of God, don't be surprised when you see the work of the devil coming right along with it. Don't be surprised, right? Why is that important? Why is that important for us to understand? Because too many believers, myself included, I will, I will confess this is um, something I used to struggle with a lot and still occasionally struggle with today, right? Too many believers are naive when it comes to the work of God. It's too easy to think, you know, when we're doing the work for God, oh, well, it's not going smoothly, so God must not be in it, right? Or, you know, something I used to think of, oh, well, it doesn't come easily to me, so clearly God doesn't want me to do that, right? Oh, it's much harder than I thought it would be. So that must mean God isn't in it. This isn't God's will, right? But in actuality, that could actually mean God is in it. And that's exactly why it's not going smoothly. Every action has an equal and opposite reaction, right? So when you, when you encounter opposition, there's four things we can do that we learned for, from Nehemiah, right? Number one, what do we always start with? Prayer. Pray to God about it. Pray to God about it right? Number two, set up a guard against them day and night. In other words, keep a watchful eye out for the opposition, right? We cannot be ignorant. We have to, we can't ignore the threats that we face. We have to keep a watchful eye, right? And, and again, using that analogy of the events in, from Nehemiah, um, did that slow down the construction of the wall? Yes, because he took 50% of his population away from construction and onto guard duty, right? So it took away the speed at which the wall was getting built, but it protected the people so that the work could continue. Right? We had to be strategic. Okay? Third, reassure those around you. I love this one. Reassure those around you. And it, Nehemiah said it this way. I, I love this. Do not be afraid. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your houses. That's Nehemiah 4.14. Right? We need to encourage the brethren and fight for them. Number four, carry on the work. I touched on this a minute ago. Carry on the work, right? Just because we're facing equal and opposite reactions from what we're doing doesn't mean that we stop. We need to carry on the work, right? The work will take a little longer, as we just discussed, right? But the work has to continue. It's God's unstoppable plan, right? If you stop the work, it's going to continue. You're not going to be a part of it, right? But we have to continue the work. The work of God must continue. Let's move ahead. Next slide, please, to verses 7 through 8. And we'll keep uh, looking to see what happens next with Paul. So it says, then he left there and went to the house of a man named Justice. Justice, a worshiper of God whose house was next to the synagogue. Boy, he went a long distance, didn't he? <laughs> uh, Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, believed in the Lord with all his household. And many of the Corinthians, when they heard, were believing and being baptized. So for any of you scholars out there, Bible studiers, does the name Crispus sound familiar to you? When Paul writes to uh, the Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, verse 14, he says, I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus. None of you except Crispus and Gaius. Uh, he was in there too. Uh, so that no one would say, you were baptized in my name. Now I did baptize also the household of Stephan Stephanas, uh, beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized any other. For Messiah, I get this, right? Messiah didn't send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Not in cleverness of speech, so that the, one, excuse me, the cross of Messiah would not be made void. Right? Interesting. Very interesting. Right? So he's talking about, he didn't even, wasn't sent by God to baptize. Um, so we have to keep in mind, as well, Paul, at this point, right, has been through a tremendous amount of opposition. Okay, he's been through a tremendous amount of opposition. And we're going to see 
um, it's taking a tax, it's taking a toll on his body physically, on his you know, emotional, mental state, right? Um, we know he was taxed physically. If you go back a couple of chapters in, in Acts chapter 8, from Acts chapter 16, excuse me, um, we know, and you're probably familiar with, Paul has some kind of physical illness, right? A thorn in his side, right? Well, back when he was in Troas in chapter 16, um, we actually see Luke kind of joining the crew at that time, right? Because that's where, in the book of Acts, it changed from his story of, you know, they did this, they did that, to we, us, right? And what was Luke's profession? He was a doctor, right? So it's, now we don't know it for sure, but it's pretty safe to assume that Paul might have asked for Luke to come along at that point because he needed a physician, right? He needed a physician. Um, he was taxed emotionally. We know his heart's desire was that the Jewish people would come to faith. So whenever he would experience something like this, right? If that's our heart's desire, and some of those people who we want to see saved oppose and don't believe, right? Um, that we saw in the previous verses, um, it's going to hurt, right? Because we care about them. And it, it should hurt. That's the right response to have, right? And we don't know what's going on essentially. I mean, maybe Paul just made his mind up that he was, he was going to leave Corinth, right? Um, and he's going to go elsewhere. Um, you know, he's shaking the dust off of his feet, right? Off of his, all of his garments at this point, right? Um, but we know God wanted him to stay. God wanted him to stay. We don't know what it was, but we do know that whatever it was, it made Paul afraid. Okay, we, it made Paul afraid. We have to remember, Paul's human just like you and I. A lot of times uh, when you speak to, to people in the believing community, we put Paul and the other apostles on some kind of pedestal, right? We forget that they're human, right? Or they're uber human maybe, <laughs> right? They're just like us. We are just like them. No different, right? No different. In fact, Paul said it this way in 1 Corinthians, I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. Don't make the mistake, brethren, of thinking Paul didn't struggle. This was not easy. It is easy for us to, to see everything that's going on here because we, oftentimes we see so many accounts of good things happening, right? Acts is all about thousands of people being added to the number of the Lord, right? Social media today, we see all these Instagram posts and, you know, whatever, of, oh, people on beaches or, or people at home, like, you know, what, right? And we see all these great things. You don't see what's behind the camera. But we're, we're caught up, we're deceived in the image we see directly in front of us, right? And people start to, to lust after and idolize that kind of lifestyle or, you know, whatever it is, glitz, glam, whatever they have, right? That is not what we are called to do. We are not called to an easy lifestyle, uh, later on in, in the letters to the Corinthians, what does all say? It says, um, he shares the gospel that he preaches. Um, it, it's a stumbling block, right, to the Jews, right? It's a stumbling block to the Jews, and it was foolishness to the Gentiles, right? So the, the Jews were, were stumbled by a Messiah who died, right? To them, Messiah was to come and be this great ruler and take over the rest of the world, right? Our Messiah can't die. Our Messiah can't die. That's not what he's supposed to do, right? They had that picture in the head of what they were, you know, that, that preconceived notion, that expectation of what he was supposed to look like. To the Greeks, the Gentiles, right? The idea of a dead and rustic savior, dead and resurrected savior was foolishness, right? It was moronic, it was moronic, okay? But remember, we are living a life for the Lord, right? Sharing and living out the good news with those around us. It's not meant to be easy. It's not meant to be easy. It's not meant to align with what the world is doing. We are here to turn the world upside down, right? We are here to turn the world upside down. We can't be deceived. Yes, God is always in control. He orchestrates all of our steps. But sometimes, right, sometimes... The wind's at our backs, and it's smooth sailing, and it's easy going. I'm not going to deny that happens sometimes, right? But sometimes that wind is pushing right up against our chests, and it is a fight to keep taking steps forward. And our natural tendency then is to associate, um, you know, that, that struggle with the belief that God isn't in it, 
that God isn't in it. And that is a lie. Don't be deceived. Don't let the distractions overwhelm you and stop you from doing the work of God. Okay? Sometimes we just have to go with it. Right? Sometimes we just have to go with life. Um, we cannot think, you know, God's path always equals easy path. That's not an equation we can live by. But if you're determined, if you believe that God has called you to, to a place, then be prepared and willing to counter any challenges or obstacles that you may face on your journey. Because they will come, right? If your boat sinks, get another boat. If your boat sinks, get another boat, right? We don't have to keep this in mind too. We don't have to see or know what's happening next. So get rid of that expectation. You, I, do not have to see and know what's happening next. God is in control. Right? Not us. God is in control. So we can stop worrying. We can cast off anxiety. And yeah, I know it's easy to say and harder to do. Right? Believe me, I know I'm right with you. But the victory is worth fighting for. The victory is, work, is worth fighting for. If you think about, you know, David, again, we can see so many accounts in, in the scriptures, both Old and New Covenants, of um, these strong, powerful men and women of the Lord. Life wasn't easy. Okay? Think about David. How many struggles he encountered, right? And that he documented. He may not even documented all of them. Right? In the Psalms especially, right, he used powerful words to describe what was going on in his life. He used words both about the struggle he was going through. He used words also describing the beauty and goodness of God and his creation. If we allow ourselves to only focus on the bad and the struggle, we will lose the truth and the foundation that God is worthy of our praise. We, again, we're not ignorant. Life is hard. We can't lose sight of that. We have to keep ourselves balanced, brethren. That though life may be hard, but God, being rich in mercy, right? But God. Yeshua said this way in Luke chapter 18, verse 1. Men ought always to pray and not to faint. Men ought always to pray and not to faint. Brethren, trials can move us toward God or they can move us away from God, Right? It is up to you, it is up to me to determine how those uh, troubles, those trials move us, right? Does God calm storms? Yeah, absolutely he can. Absolutely God can calm storms. But most often, at least I found in my life, and I'm assuming it's, it's true for most of y'all as well, most of the time he looks, to co he looks for us to step out of the boat in the midst of a storm, right? He wants us to be the calm in the storm. So we have to ask ourselves, are we willing to step out? Or are we going to say, I'm not stepping out, God, until you calm this storm. Right? Well, my feet might get wet or something. Right? Or I might drown. Or are we going to say, I trust you, God. I don't understand. I don't understand. I'm going to trust you and step out. You're calling me to step out, and I'll do that. Right? It will tax you physically. It will tax you emotionally. But souls will be one. Souls will be one. Right? Righteousness comes to us from God only by grace through faith in Yeshua the Messiah. It's not about works, it's about grace. Right? And this message that Paul is proclaiming, the same message that you and I can proclaim, that Paul's doing here in the synagogues and, and here in our world today, it's, it's earth shattering. And when Paul would give this message, something would always happen in response. He either got kicked out, beat up, thrown in jail, threatened, right? It was one or all of the above. But it was also more than this. As we talk about our lesson from, from looking at, at Psalms and thinking about David, right? In addition to these negative things happening, we see people coming to faith. We see souls being won for the Lord. So we have to challenge our perception. If you're faced with opposition, with threats, wind pushing against you from a massive storm, what do you do? What do you think? How do you perceive it? Do you think God is, must not be in it? 
Were things difficult for Paul? Yeah, right? Was Paul discouraged? Yes. Was Paul afraid? Yes. Yes, absolutely. But I like the way I've got a quote um, to read to you from uh, an author named Chuck Colson, who was a guy who founded um, the Prison Fellowship Ministry. Right? And he said this, It is absurd for believers to expect a miraculous answer to every need. It's absurd, right? From curing ingrown toenails to finding parking places, this only leads to faith in miracles instead of faith in God. Right? What are we praying for? What are we looking for in the face of opposition? Are we looking for the miracle because we want to have faith in the miracles? Because things will go away and become easy for us? Are we going to have faith in God and in his ability to help us endure the trials that we will face? Right? Trouble amplifies the reality that we're in a fallen world. Yes, right? But also amplifies our need to keep our priorities. Keep our priorities and keep balanced, right? Be steadfast in faith, right? Be steadfast in your faith in God. Live with a peace that surpasses all understanding. Actually live that way. Okay? Let's keep going. Get the verses uh, 9 to 11, please. It says, And the Lord said to Paul in the night by a vision, Do not be afraid any longer, but go on speaking and do not be silent, for I am with you, and no man will attack you in order to harm you, for I have many people in this city. And he settled there, Paul, a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. So here we see the Lord making three promises to Paul, right? Makes three promises to Paul for why he needs to not be afraid anymore. Why he needs to continue speaking and not be silent, right? Number one, I promise you my presence, for I am with you. He's Emmanuel, God with us, right? Second promise, I promise you my protection. No one will come at you. No man will attack you in order to harm you. Now keep in mind, important perspective here, clearly this was only for a time period, right? We know Paul didn't uh, you know, die of old age, he was beheaded, right? So this promise was for a certain time and a certain purpose, okay? Not is the rest of his entire life. But for this time, no man will attack you. I promise you my protection. And the third promise, I promise you I'm in control. I have many people in this city. You are not alone. There are many in this city whom will become believers. You need to keep on speaking in order for that to happen. Do not be silent. Go on speaking. Right? Isaiah says, no weapon formed against us shall prosper. It doesn't say that no weapon shall be formed against us. Does that make sense? Do you understand the distinction? It doesn't say that just no weapon will be formed against us. No, it says that those weapons that are formed will not be successful. They will not prosper. Right? Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Psalm 23, 4. So what's holding back, this is the question we have to ask ourselves, what's holding back the spread of the good news in our generation today? What's holding it back? Is there no one to hear it? No, oh, there's plenty of people, right? Harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. It's fear. Fear is what holds us back, right? We're afraid to share it. We're afraid that if we, if we talk about the Messiah, talk about salvation, that we're going to lose our friends, we're going to lose our jobs. If we allow this to discourage us, fear to discourage us, then let's be real, we're denying the very presence of God. We're denying the very purpose of God. We're denying the very protection of God. Yes, we are to be wise in how we share the good news. 
Yes, we need to tailor our approach to our audience, right? Our words need to be seasoned with salt. But we have to get past our fears in order to do this. We have to keep building the wall in Nehemiah's time. Paul has to keep carrying on speaking and not going silent. How do we do that? Because believe me, I know it is hard. How do you do that? Well, remember that he's with you, that though they may attack you, they cannot harm you. And know that the safest place to be is in the will of God. But the question comes, and the question I certainly had in looking at this was, you know, it's pretty powerful that, that the Lord says, do not be afraid any longer. What was Paul afraid of? Why was he afraid? Right? Clearly, we, we know opposition wasn't new to him. Why did it take this particular event for God to specifically speak to Paul in a vision at night and say, do not be afraid any longer? What made this time different? Right? But to know the answer to that question, think about what's going on here. Right? The leader of this synagogue just came to faith. Right? The leader of this synagogue just came to faith along with his household and along with many other uh, Corinthians, right? both Jews and Greeks. And later in, in verse 12, um, you see that uh, this, it boiled the blood right, of, of many of the others who were in the synagogue. It didn't sit well with them, just like it didn't sit well with Sanballat and his armies. Right? Same opposition. Same opposition. And I think, you know, Paul was not only obviously concerned for himself, I think he was concerned for his flock. Because he's having these new believers, right, coming to faith. And he knows they're going to face opposition. Got to remember, the problem with success is that you get attacked. Right? You become a target. In the book of Romans, Paul wrote, you know, while he was in Corinth, right, he wrote the book of Romans while he was here in Corinth. Um, in chapter 16, verse 23, he says, Gaius, host to me and to the whole congregation, greets you. So from this, an entire congregation is built. And then Paul writes, right? This entire congregation greets you. Right? This was exactly God's promise. The establishment of an entire congregation because now, it's not just Paul proclaiming Yeshua is the Messiah and him crucified. Now, it's the entire congregation in Corinth that can share the good news, right? This was worth waiting for. This was worth waiting for. That's what God was trying to communicate to Paul. I have a plan here. And Paul's fulfillment of his calling was by faith, not by Fear. He had to put aside fear. Do not be afraid any longer, right? Though opposition will come because of our message, trust in God and don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Think of this. Yeshua knew before he even became flesh and dwelt among us that he was going to die. I, I can't imagine, right? Imagine knowing that you're, you're, you're coming into existence only to face certain painful death. He knew that was going to happen. And we know he wrestled with it. But what did he say? Not my will be done, but yours. Right? But yours. He knew he was going to die a painful death. But because of his love for you and for me, he walked in the power of the promise of God. Right? So when his fears crept up and they came to the surface, he put his fears in their place. Right? This was the very thing that Paul was wrestling with right here. Right? And instead of leaving Corinth, he stays there for 18 months. 18 months. Longer than he stayed anywhere else at this time, which is second only to Ephesus, which is later on in his life. Um, I think he stays there about three years in total, right? So Paul was here in Corinth, if I got my timing right, from the fall of A.D. 50 to the spring of A.D. 52. And then in A.D. 52, something happens which changes the whole political landscape of where he was, right? And that's something that, you know, Achaia, this region he was in, where Corinth was, um, gets a new governor. 
All right, and this, this new governor's name was uh, Gallio, not Galileo, for those of you thinking of Bohemian Rhapsody, um, but Gallio, right? Um, so then the question becomes, you know, what does this new turn of events, this new political appointment mean for Paul? What does it mean for God's unstoppable plan? Well, um, to know that, you're going to have to join next week, Shabbat school, we, we break further into the book of Acts. Um, but again, I mentioned the Lord really speaking to me, saying, encourage my brethren. I have small kids. They're living up, you know, growing up in a dark world, looking way darker than it was, than the one was that I grew up in, right? We cannot be afraid. We have to trust God. Times are uncertain. I mean, we've got a, a disease, a pandemic, spreading across not just this country, but the world. Not a single place is unaffected by this disease, right? We, we've heard it from Sam and others here. Are you going to be afraid or are you going to have faith? And sometimes, I'm going to be honest, that can sound cliche or that we're out of touch with reality, uh, you know, when, when believers are saying that. But we are, need to be, and we are, very well aware of reality, right? That life as a believer is hard. We will go through challenges, right? But remember, we are not alone. This has happened to so many people. And we just only looked at a few, right? Paul, obviously, Nehemiah, David. How many others in all of the scriptures have gone through struggles, pretty much all of them. So don't fall victim to fear. Don't let it convince you that though you are being, you know, facing a giant wave or a strong wind, don't let it make you think that God's not with you. And don't think that just because God is with you that it's going to be easy to keep going. But it, believe me, it is worth it. Because of Paul's endurance and his willingness to put aside fear and have faith in God, an entire congregation was established to proclaim the good news and be a light in Corinth. Right? Think about that. Corinth was a place that worshipped idols. Right? Worshipped idols. Um, it was known for, uh, it had this acropolis um, to this goddess named Athenia. Right? She was the goddess of love and sex and um, all of that, right? Um, and she kept in her temple a thousand priestesses, right? Which in modern day terms, we call them prostitutes, right? And sailors and people who would go to Corinth, these priestesses would come out and earn money, right? And bring them back to this, this goddess, Athena, right? Sounds pretty awful. But did Paul skip over that town? And say, I don't want anything to do with that. Those awful, sinful people. No. No. He didn't skip over. And it, you can read later in, in his, uh, 1 Corinthians. He even talks about how it's these people who have become the congregation in Corinth. Right? You want to talk about living a transformed life? Don't pass over somebody because they're a prostitute or a robber or... A lawyer, <laughs> right? Everybody needs to hear the good news. Don't forget where you once were. I know where I was. You want to talk about a, a changed life by the grace of God, right? All people need to hear the good news that we have. We can be a light. We are lights. We can cover ourselves up or we can share our, our message. We can shine brightly. Turn the world upside down, brethren. That's what we're here to do. And for you youngins who are still listening, turn the world upside down. Do it. See what happens. I think it's going to be cool. Let's pray. Avinu, Father, thank you, Lord, for this day, for this Shabbat, for your faithfulness uh, to your word, to your people, to the world. Thank you for encouragement. Um, Lord, I, I pray for each person who has heard this, mes heard this message today, Lord, that they would have heard your voice, voice and not my own, um, but that they would be encouraged. 
to know the reality of the world that we live in, that we will encounter wind, waves, storms, trials, tribulations. We will be taxed physically, we will be taxed emotionally, but God, being rich in mercy, right? But God, may we, Lord, not lose perspective that while we endure trials, may we cast aside fear and cling to faith because you have a plan. You are in control. We don't need to see what the future holds, Lord, because we know you, and you know what the future holds. So I pray that you would strengthen each person to step out of the boat, even in the midst of a storm, because you're calling them, because you have a powerful, soul-changing, life-changing, earth-shattering plan. It is an unstoppable plan. Light a fire in us, God, that we can be an effective part of this plan, reaching out to those around us, knowing how to speak to bankers, prostitutes, whomever else, Lord. All have sinned and fall short, ourselves included. But those of us who were once, our sins were once as scarlet, you now see as white as snow, cleansed by the blood of your Son, Yeshua, our Messiah. It is these people whom you can take and transform into a congregation that shines brightly into their community. Let us shine this great gospel of grace today. In the name of Yeshua we pray. Amen. God bless you guys. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, James. If you please stand, if you're able to. The Lord desires to place his name upon you and bless you abundantly this day. So if you'll just close your eyes and by faith just receive his blessing as I bless you now. Yivrechecha Adonai v'yishmerecha Ya'er Adonai panivelecha v'chuneka Isa Adonai panivelecha V'yasem lecha shalom. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Shabbat shalom. We hope Bezrat Hashem and the, uh, God's help that you will see you again next Shabbat at 1030.